Uh, thank you very much, Shangli. I'll just uh, share my screen and go into a, oops. Uh, Uh, excuse me. Right, hopefully you can see my screen. Okay, uh, so thank you for the uh, the warm introduction. Uh, what I'll be spending the next 20 minutes talking about is uh, basically is based largely on a survey that we completed at the Center for Alternative Finance on this question of uh, artificial intelligence in financial services, which we completed uh, with the World Economic Forum and is uh, freely available in terms of the full report on our, our website. Um, so what I'll quickly cover is uh, just to level set a little bit on AI, so we're all talking about the same thing, uh, talk a bit about adoption within financial services, talk a little bit about the uh, specific technologies and the uh, specific use cases, just to give some examples of that. Uh, to try and put the survey into context and then finish with some uh, comments on both uh, some of the hurdles that exist with AI deployment and some uh, forward-looking statements. Uh, so first of all, in terms of uh, what is AI, this is not a bad uh, description, I think. Uh, actually comes from my uh, previous role at IBM, uh, but looking at it in four major categories of use. One around perception, uh, natural language understanding, visual recognition, etc. Uh, one around responding, so question and answer, speech to text, text to speech, language translation, etc. Uh, thirdly, around thinking and learning, such as uh, discovery services for uh, deriving meaning out of uh, news, for example. And then uh, deciding and acting, uh, things like uh, trade-off analytics, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so th these are obviously a broad set of capabilities, a relatively narrow set of ca capabilities, each of their own. Uh, but they do have multiple types of application within financial services, as we'll see in a minute. So uh, a key comment, I think, is a lot of the um, innovation within AI and financial services is coming from the fintechs. Um, and this is obviously just a description of some of the fintechs in all industries. But what we're seeing is obviously an awful lot of innovation in terms of deployment uh, within uh, the fintech community. And it's for that reason that in our survey, uh, which we looked at about 150 firms in total, uh, roughly half of them were from the fintech community, small and large uh, fintechs, uh, as well as from the incumbent financial services institutions. And here you can see the distribution of revenues within the firms that participated. So obviously fintechs weighted towards the left, uh, but we did have one fintech in the 50 to 100 billion revenue uh, range, and obviously large uh, financial uh, institutions as well. So it's an interesting cross-section. And unlike the FCA Bank of England uh, survey that uh, Yang Ying mentioned, uh, this is uh, global. So we have representations from uh, pretty much all the major countries. And I've given the link there for the uh, survey itself if you wish to download it. Uh, so as I said, we captured from 150 uh, odd financial institutions. This gives you an idea of the distribution. Uh, so around 40% within the deposits and lending business. Uh, and then followed by investment management, insurance, market infrastructure payments, and uh, capital markets. Um, so in terms of adoption, first off, we uh, can see that AI is seen as being very strategic and particularly increasingly strategic over a two-year time frame. Uh, but what's interesting, I think, is uh, the percentages, as you can see, are higher on the fintech side than they are on the incumbent bank side. Uh, so to a large extent, AI is being embraced and exploited uh, more aggressively by uh, fintechs than it is by incumbent financial institutions. As you can see, for example, uh, it is seen as being uh, very high by 18% of fintechs uh, for this year, uh, down to 12% as far as the incumbent financial institutions are concerned. Um, in terms of the most prevalent application area, uh, we see risk management as being uh, the most, uh, the biggest focus uh, in terms of using AI, followed by generation of new revenue potential through new products and services, followed by customer service, uh, then automation, RPA, et cetera, uh, and finally around client acquisition. Though obviously there, there isn't a huge difference between the uh, uh, percentages in terms of what's already been uh, implemented, as you can see, but these are the most uh, common use cases we've been seeing. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is that uh, those that are investing most in AI within both fintechs and uh, incumbents uh, tend to invest proportionally more after that. Uh, so the high spenders tend to be also the, the firms that are the biggest, the firms that are increasing their investment in AI most. 
Um, so, the, you know, the ones that are investing less in AI tend to continue investing less proportionally. And we're also seeing uh, a correlation against uh, profitability, i.e. the return that firms are seeing for the investment they're making in AI, AI with a tipping point around, as you can see, uh, the 2 to 10 percent of their R&D budget being allocated to AI. As soon as investment exceeds that 2 to 10 percent, then there seems to be a proportional increase in profitability um, that's being delivered by that AI investment. And that's another indication, I think, why those that are already investing in the above that 2 to 10 percent range are seeing uh, proportional increases in profitability and therefore uh, have a very strong incentive to invest more. And those that are at the lower end uh, won't be seeing those returns and therefore may not have that incentive. Uh, we're also seeing uh, most of the, as I said before, the innovation is coming from the fintechs rather than the uh, incumbents. Uh, so the top part of this diagram illustrates the generation of new revenue potential. So you know, revenue generating ideas and uh, propositions uh, that are coming, uh, becoming developed through AI. And again, fintechs at 56%, uh, leading the uh, percentage for incumbents at 49%. Uh, for that's revenue generation and the same percentage also uh, is very similar for those which are focused on process re-engineering and automation which uh, the focus there being much more on cost reduction than obviously on revenue generation. Um, a lot has been said about the impact on AI in uh, employment terms within the industry. Uh, again there's a different perspective here between incumbents and fintechs with uh, incumbency in a short uh, short term three percent increase in employment, but followed by declines because more and more roles or parts of roles more likely are being replaced by AI capabilities. So uh, a 9% reduction uh, by the 2030 timescale, uh, according to what the incumbents are telling us, uh, which contrasts with the fintechs where it's net positive. So over all these timeframes, uh, there are job opportunities uh, being created by AI deployment. So you can see there's a bit of a uh, brain drain maybe to some extent from uh, financial services incumbents towards the fintechs in that respect. Um, in terms of the types of use cases being distributed across the, the major market segments we've surveyed, uh, as you can see, uh, investment managers are probably the most widely um, accessing AI capabilities within their industry. So 61% uh, with a focus there being on new revenue potential. Uh, followed by process re-engineering, etc. So you can see there's quite a broad distribution across the major uh, segments within the industry against the use cases I was referring to before. Um, we also looked at data. Obviously, AI is only as good as the data it consumes. Uh, so where does the data come from in the first instance? So as you can see on the top of the slide, mostly it uh, most common use is from internally generated data, which is not that surprising, of course. Uh, followed by customer generating data and then publicly available data, be it free or on a, a chargeable basis. In terms of data types, uh, again, maybe not too surprising, but data social media is represented as the highest, most commonly used uh, data type, followed by uh, data that may be provided from payment providers. And that obviously gives great insights in terms of uh, individual spending habits, that sort of thing. Uh, geolocation data, and then further down the line, some sources of alternative data, such as satellite imagery and weather, and we'll come back to that as one of the uh, case studies later. So in terms of use cases, um, there are many. In the interest of time, I'm not able to show uh, too many um, examples of this. Uh, this is an example of one that uh, a fintech that was uh, yeah, part of the Barclays Accelerator this year. Uh, there are others that provide this kind of capability, but this is in the context of car rentals or uh, driving authorities uh, being able to capture damage to cars uh, very quickly just based on a uh, video uh, survey of the car when it's been returned from a rental period. Uh, and obviously the AI is able to give a fact-based, pretty accurate uh, assessment of where the damage is. Uh, and in particular, being able to identify uh, where those difficult uh, visual images may be to identify damage for things like damage to headlights. Uh, so in a very quick way, uh, this is able to uh, identify any damage, uh, take readings from the odometer and the fuel gauge uh, to understand what the, uh, all that information in a, in a way which is uh, factually representative and giving a very accurate uh, perspective on, uh, on those uh, factors. Um, uh, another example, uh, this is from my previous role again. Uh, I haven't got time to show you a live demo of this, but uh, it's uh, quite interesting. I've given you the link to it below. Uh, and essentially, uh, you can uh, input text from an individual, be it their speech or their blog or 
uh, tweets, that sort of thing. Uh, and provided you have uh, enough of that textual information, uh, this uh, tool then does a psychometric, a, a psycho, uh, psycholinguistic, I should say, uh, analysis of the individual to be able to build this kind of sunburst uh, perspective on personality. Uh, I tried it myself with a speech by uh, the US president, uh, and you do get some quite interesting perspectives in terms of uh, things like his uh, stability, emotionality, that sort of thing. So uh, you might want to play with that both with your own uh, speeches or, or texts, uh, or indeed other personalities such as Oprah Winfrey, as you can see on this particular example. Uh, but seriously, the uh, use of this is, for, is being used, for example, within wealth management to make sure that uh, you know, based on the communications from a wealth client, uh, that uh, they, they are matched to a wealth advisor who is most complementary uh, in terms of personality so that they could, their relationship clicks much more effectively than it might do uh, with just taking a, a much more random perspective in terms of how, how to allocate wealth managers uh, to clients. Another example I touched on, uh, weather and uh, satellite data. This is an example of being able to combine for the continental US uh, very high density, high definition uh, satellite photography of fields, uh, being able to really get to very low levels of precision in terms of the uh, high levels of precision, I should say, in terms of the, uh, the photography in order to be able to uh, identify crop health, uh, combining that with uh, weather, precision weather down to half a kilometer or so, and using those combination, you can therefore make assessments of soil moisture down to five levels of depth within the soil. And through that, being able to identify uh, forecasting yield uh, within particular fields. Uh, this is obviously useful to farmers in their own right to be spraying uh, parts of the field which may be diseased rather than spraying healthy crops, which is both uh, expensive and not necessarily good for healthy crops. Uh, but more importantly, in the context of financial services, it gives the means to uh, predict in advance uh, what the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, will be reporting in their regular crop reports which then has an impact obviously on uh, pricing of uh, uh, grain such as wheat and barley, et cetera. Uh, so already being used by uh, commodity traders to uh, get a, an insight as to where the crop yield reports are heading uh, from a trading advantage point of view. Uh, I, credit analysis is also a key use case. So this gives you an idea of the results that have been reported in the survey. Uh, so while some are seeing relatively modest improvements in terms of uh, credit defaults, so 40% uh, seeing a reductions in the range 1 to 5%. As you can see, 7% of those uh, surveyed who are using AI in credit default analysis or uh, credit analytics are uh, seeing a more than 30% reduction in credit defaults, which is pretty significant in terms of the business performance it can have. Uh, to give you a, a local example here in the UK of uh, AI being used in credit analysis, uh, Oak North is one of the uh, relatively few profitable uh, fintechs uh, within the UK. Uh, it operates as a digital bank making SME loans using, as you can see in the bottom left, uh, AI uh, in terms of being able to make very accurate decisions. And uh, they only suffered their first default at all at the, I think it was the end of last year. At the time of writing, this was about a year old, this slide, so they'd already lent about 3.7 billion. It's uh, much bigger than that these days. Um, they also are an interesting example of acting as a, a lender in the UK, uh, but then market their platform on an AI as a service basis, if you like, to other countries and other institutions in other countries. So basically white label outside of their home market. Uh, but it's a very interesting organization in terms of uh, being a startup focused on AI uh, and using AI very effectively for lending. Uh, just a, a final example, uh, asset management is another key area of focus, as I mentioned before. Uh, the most common use cases for AI in investment management are around risk around the portfolio itself, uh, followed by portfolio structuring, uh, price forecasting and volatility forecasting, and then further down uh, execution of orders uh, within the markets and uh, sustainable investing. Uh, another uh, example of that uh, is uh, Arabesque. They're a fund manager. Uh, have invested a great deal in building an AI capability in terms of taking in multiple sources of data on the left-hand side, uh, having a proprietary AI engine, which then is used to uh, do portfolio construction, one of the examples I, I mentioned just now, uh, which is, has been proven very effective in terms of the investment returns they're seeing. Uh, if you go onto their website, you can see how this uh, technology is being used uh, to do uh, investment analysis of ESG uh, candidates. 
in terms of uh, uh, that particular category of investment. Uh, just a few words on uh, hurdles to implementation. Uh, obviously, it requires some uh, oversight, I guess, is the key point in terms of AI deployment. For example, one another use case for AI is being able to do segment analysis. You have a client base, uh, you're using AI to be able to extract uh, potential clients for a particular, a particular proposition. For example, you may be looking at those who are born in a particular country of a certain age, uh, with certain wealth, other characteristics they may have in common, uh, but the danger is you end up with you no know, extremes. So uh, Ozzy Osbourne and Prince Charles actually share all these categories together, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily see them as uh, equivalents in terms of uh, providing any financial service offering to them, to either of them in that respect. Um, so uh, there is uh, some oversight needed in terms of uh, these kinds of analysis. Maybe these are outliers, uh, but they still give you an illustration of some of the uh, uh, things that can go wrong in that respect. Uh, other hurdles, obviously, around data. So the quality of data and availability data is pretty, pretty key. Uh, increasingly, as AI takes further hold within financial services, there's also a talent acquisition uh, challenge. Anna was mentioned in the introduction, uh, trust is a, is a key factor as well followed by bias, and I'll come on to bias in a minute. Uh, credit analytics uh, also are, the analysis we did on credit analysis also shows that uh, bias is a, is a key issue. Um, so for those that are using AI for a credit decision making, uh, as you can see, 40%, 47%, nearly half said uh, bias already exists uh, within uh, how credit analysis is done. Uh, but that AI would potentially make this decision making even worse. It could uh, worsen the extent of bias. Uh, whereas 38% uh, um, didn't see it as so much of an issue. Um, so there is quite a significant risk that bias will come into you know, use cases such as credit analysis. And that's exactly, of course, what we've seen happen in the field. Uh, you know, a famous example of that being Steve Wozniak. Uh, when he, his wife was offered a, a credit card by Apple with a much lower credit limit than he himself had, although essentially they had the same wealth profile as a couple. Um, what's interesting is I believe Apple and Goldman Sachs, who partnered with them on the card, uh, state that there is no gender uh, within the gender information within the data that was used for the credit analysis. Uh, that obviously leads to uh, the question in terms of how can you detect gen uh, gender bias if you have no gender information in, in your source data. Um, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is uh, there's the risk of proxy information. So even though you don't use gender within your analysis, the risk is there's other information there which is correlated to gender, such as uh, the location of shopping. And we saw that was one of the data sources being used in terms of what payment providers uh, give, uh, because obviously males and females will have different profiles in terms of where they shop. And if you're using that in any kind of way uh, as part of the credit decision, then you're allocating, you know, basically correlating to gender again. So proxy data is also uh, a challenge to overcome as far as bias is concerned. Just some closing comments on uh, looking forward. Uh, the capabilities we've been seeing, such as the decision making and the natural languaging processing, et cetera, there are examples of uh, specific technologies, so-called narrow AI. And what we're seeing as we move forward is this notion of broad AI, where uh, AI capabilities will span many things all in an integrated form, which obviously has the potential to be much more uh, A, disruptive, and B, pervasive in terms of the impact it might have on financial services. And you know, once the technologies uh, go even beyond, when you consider how far we've gone in five years, uh, to what that might be looking further out, uh, then obviously it could be quite revolutionary. And that's obviously leading to some of the concerns that people like Elon Musk and et cetera have uh, indicated in terms of where the real risk may be when we end up with that kind of capability over that kind of timescale. Uh, there is hope for humans, so all of us. Uh, only 10% of the FinTech community, for example, saw AI solutions within FS being uh, fully autonomous. Uh, mostly it's seen as uh, being complementary, augmenting human uh, capability, not replacing human capability. Uh, so hopefully most of us have a future in this kind of respect, though, as you can see, there is a different perception on that between uh, incumbents and uh, fintechs. And finally, um, the future landscape from the survey participants, uh, you know, there was quite a balanced view, I think, in terms of the level of disruptive effects that might happen. Uh, but there was quite a strong uh, perspective, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, which concerns both fintechs, i.e. the smaller ones, 
and also incumbent organizations in terms of the threat they face from uh, big tech. Um, so we've touched on Ant Financial and its new name and obviously going through uh, IPO in Hong Kong shortly as well. Uh, those are the kinds of firms and uh, likewise Amazon, uh, Facebook, etc. Uh, that cause more concern uh, to both uh, the smaller non-large fintechs and also incumbents. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your time attention and hand back to Hong Yi. Okay, so can I see the big screen or? Okay, so thank you very much for, for your wonderful uh, introduction of what AI is, because I think um, everyone here are very interested in um, how AI can implement our life and work and how it can develop. And um, your presentation is very vivid. You use some pictures and uh, even some videos to show us uh, the development of AI and how it in, uh, impacts uh, human beings' life. So uh, thank you again for Keith Bear's wonderful speech. Thank you. And then uh, we will still have uh, a speech ahead of us that is from Dan. Hi, Dan. Hey. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So next, you will give us a speech on your, uh, uh, on your uh, point of view. So this is your yeah. time. I'm just bringing up my, my slides. Give me one moment. OK. I hope that I can do it swiftly. So yeah, oh. speaking of AI, I think everyone <laughs> has his own ideas and imaginations. So let's welcome Dan to give us his speech. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's kind of difficult to follow up, uh, you know, after such a great uh, overview of the use of AI in financial services from Keith. So I'll, I'll try my best to augment a little bit to what, what Keith said. Um, Keith gave us a very good uh, broad overview of how we can use AI in financial services overall. I will be focusing on something that is quite niche I'll be looking at the ethical use of AI in the financial market specifically today. And um, let me just get straight into it. So um, basically I'll do a very brief introduction. Uh, we've, we've heard most about it already. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what governments already do in the space of ethical use of AI. And then really I wanna talk a little bit about the principles that are necessary to observe when we use machine learning in the financial markets. And I'm um, not sure, we're probably not going to have Q&A, but we're going to have some discussion after my, after my short presentation. So I think we can jump over my introduction because Hongyi already introduced me. This is real quick. This is my co-author of um, a recent book chapter um, where we're trying to discuss this topic. Um, Tiffany, also based in, um, based in London, um, very uh, knowledgeable in the space of machine learning and financial markets. But I want to really start with a little history lesson, and I'll jump through these five milestones really quickly, but history lesson of the use of AI in financial markets. And basically all started with this gentleman. I don't know whether you have heard about him, but Jim Simmons basically started to use machine learning technologies and methods in 1982 to build a company that we know as Renaissance Technologies. And Renaissance Technologies is arguably one of the most successful investment firms in the world. You compare them with um, you know, risk-adjusted returns with any, any of the big names, Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio, he, he outperforms them all, right? So um, there's, there's really a nice book written by Gregory Zuckerman recently um, that describes a little bit the life uh, and the challenges that Jim Simmons had to go through but um, what it tells us is that some of these methods that are really uh, on board now have been around for a long time. Right? It's just that uh, people couldn't really use them because the computing power was too expensive to buy and the data was also not available. So that's the main difference between perhaps 40 years ago and, and today. Um, what else happened? Uh, I want to build a little bit on one of the slides that Keith also mentioned, um, alternative data suddenly has become like a very big business, right? So we're not only relying, especially in the financial markets, on um, perhaps financial reports that we can gather. We also can uh, rely on satellite images. I think Keith also mentioned, um, there's a company based out of Singapore here called Blue Fire AI that scrapes all of the 
investment forums in China, because we know that in China, a lot of the information is not in the price, right? So they're trying to augment that and then create trading signals on the back of it that help people manage risks, not so much uh, make money, but help, help manage risks. Yeah? And um, this, this is this really exciting space. And um, there's a very interesting paper that I'm quoting here as well, uh, Rethinking, as I said, an institutional investment, which basically talks about the right way to use this alternative data. Yeah. Okay. Third, third thing really evolves around a personality. So um, Marcos Lopez de Prado is a, is, a, is a very smart gentleman from Spain. I think he uh, used to be the head of machine learning at AQR, one of the biggest um, quant funds in the world. And he is really trying to, to help democratize the use of machine learning in the financial markets by um, documenting how these methods can, can be applied properly. Um, because he always compares uh, machine learning uh, with a with a dangerous weapon in the hands of somebody that perhaps doesn't know how to how to manage uh, this dangerous weapon, right? So he's trying to help people understand how to do it properly, and I think that um, gathered a lot of interest from all sorts of people. And where in the past perhaps you used to have very very smart um, researchers that. Um, had the ability to come up with new machine learning algorithms. Now we have a large amount of machine learning algorithms available that many other people can use relatively easily, right? So it's a lot more um, accessible, which drives the, the adoption. Um, number four, actually fascinating for um, investment management, right? So there's a, uh, this paper that I'm showing here uh, entitled Empirical Asset Pricing via Machine Learning. And why is this paper so important? It only came out not even two years ago. It basically says that if you use machine learning, um, you will be able to understand expected returns better than if you don't. And then you think about this, right? It basically says that if there are two companies that look pretty much the same, have same capabilities, same client base, same AUM, same everything, but one knows how to use machine learning and one doesn't, then there's, there's empirical proof now that the, the company that uses machine learning will be able to do a better job at investment management. So it's an encouragement for all of us uh, in financial markets to really start investigating how we can use machine learning techniques um, on behalf of our clients. Okay, last of the five is really something that I'm quite excited about, only happened last year. Um, also talking about democratizing of um, the use of machine learning. Um, a new institute was created, FDP Institute, that basically allows people to learn the nuts and bolts of how to use machine learning and natural language processing in the markets. And I think, again, on the, on the path from moving from a few select researchers that were perhaps familiar with all of these methods to um, giving the you know, the, the larger group of people that work in finance access to be able to use machine learning, this is, a, this is a major step. So this is all quite exciting, but now we need to talk about ethics, right? Because if there's a new technology, um, that always comes with, with certain risks that we need to look at. And, um, you know, some of you could argue um, ethics and markets, isn't that a bit of an oxymoron? I don't know whether you've seen this movie here that I'm putting here up on the, on the right-hand side, Humming, <coughs> the Hummingbird Project. Um, basically a movie about two brothers that are trying to establish a network connection between the New York Stock Exchange and a rural exchange somewhere in, in, you know, in the center of the United States. And the objective of creating that connection is to gain one microsecond in, um, in latency, right? And um, why is the movie called The Hummingbird Project? Because it takes one microsecond for the hummingbird to flap, right? So, so you could argue that, you know, having faster access than everyone else is a bit of an ethical challenge, right? It's unfair. So let's talk a little bit more about ethics and the use of machine learning. So what I'm, what I'm gonna share about is all captured in a chapter that we have written as part of the AI book that was launched in May, 2020. So this year, quite recent. 
and um, is the work of Tiffany and I that uh, tried to operationalize a little bit some of these, these principles. But we start with two opposing views from two financial market experts. So the first one that I'm, that I'm showing you here is the one of Matthew Cannon. He used to be the head of global markets in HSBC and is now a partner in a, in a Singapore-based hedge fund. And he says, humans have found it impossible to encode ethical standards in finance. So we generally get principle-based guidance, like do the right thing. You know, if you've worked in a big bank, you will have heard this before. Um, it will take AI a long time, he says, to learn the difference between right and wrong on matters where human experts often disagree. Right? So he basically says, wow, ethics and AI, that is really challenging. I don't know how, how, we, can, how we can ever get there. And then let's go to the next one. The next one is from Marcos Lopez de Prado himself. What does he say? He says, financial transactions are fraught with agency problems today huh? without AI. One solution is to replace human judgment with smart systematic processes. Another solution is to deploy algorithms that monitor human decisions in search for the biases. In both cases, AI has an important role to play. So if you compare those two statements, one of them says, no way that AI can be ethical ever. The other one says, markets are so fraught with biases and unfairness. If we don't use AI, we will never get to a fair market. So two opposing views. And as you know, whenever you have a research work ahead of you, it's good to have something controversial, right? So we thought that is a, is a good sign that two experts disagree. Um, many of the regulators around the world have understood that the ethical use of AI is something that needs attention. And um, I'm just trying to quote a few um, pieces of work that, that different regulators put together. There's one in Hong Kong, there's something by the European Union. Um, there's obviously multiple documents here in Singapore from the uh, Personal Data Protection Commission, but also from the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where certain principles are outlined for people to um, live by when they use AI. And you know, you'd be surprised. Beijing also released a document that tackles the same topic, right? And um, it's, it's not surprising that most of these documents actually there's a very big match in terms of what they're stipulating. Yeah? So that's, that's the government attention. I now wanna move um, into the nuts and bolts of my presentation really, which is all about how can we think about these principles that I'm listing here, fairness, privacy, transparency, explainability, and accountability, especially uh, in a setting uh, that is perhaps you know, closest to a, to a trading floor. And why do we think it's so important is because if I went to the head of markets or the head of trading in a large financial services organization today, and I said, look, um, you need to make sure that your AI uh, algorithm is explainable. It's not so tangible, right? So we try to put a little bit of meat on the bone to help people think about what these terms actually mean. So let me start with the first one. The first one is, um, is about fairness. And I'm um, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my screen here. Um, so the first one is about fairness. So what, what is fairness all about? Well, is treating stakeholders impartially and just um, without being unfair, right? And um, if you think about it again, you know, the, the Hummingbird Project, maybe the fairness issue is as old as the markets themselves, because there are always people who try to um, act in, a, in an unfair way. What does that actually mean in the context of machine learning in markets, right? So there's a, there's a particular type of algorithms called the reinforcement al uh, learning algorithms. And these learning algorithms, you can think about them as um, agents that basically get compensated based on the quality of the decision that they make. So if they make a good decision, they get a point. And if they make a bad decision, somebody removes a point from their balance. So these reinforcement uh, learning algorithms will basically um, understand um, the data and then try to act and optimize towards getting a lot of points, right? And what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that these algorithms don't have a conscience, right? So if they, if they, if they see that um, activities like wash trading or spoofing or pump and dump or you know, front running type of activities are the ones that get them the most points, well, then they will engage in that. 
right? So what we really need to do is we need to uh, create um, a governance framework to make sure that these type of algorithms don't engage in unfair trading activity, similar to basically telling the humans, the human traders, that they're not allowed to pursue some of these activities. Yeah. Okay, so we move on to privacy. Privacy is a, is a, is a big problem um, when we talk about centralized financial markets, right? And if we look at the dictionary, basically privacy means that someone is uh, entitled to keep their personal matters and relationships secret or private, you know, disclose the information that they want to disclose only. And in centralized financial marketplaces, this is an issue. Why? Because there's a lot of cyber uh, terrorism type of activity going on. In fact, um, Hong Kong Monetary Authority published a report that said that the attacks on Hong Kong financial services institutions are on a rise, right? And um, I promise you, we've written this chapter before the Hong Kong Stock Exchange got hacked last year. So when we saw that news come out, it kind of confirmed that this is a real threat, right? And it's very easy to, to imagine how some of these um, rogue actors will use AI to basically exploit markets unfairly, um, perhaps by trading based on information that um, is centrally stored at the exchanges, but not for um, not available for the for the use. So, what are we suggesting? Well, we're suggesting to use a technology um, that is known as zero knowledge proofs to make sure that this data can be stored in a safe. Fashion. And I'm not sure whether you have heard about this zero knowledge proof technology, but the easiest way to understand it is to basically think about you wanting to go and see a adult movie. Yeah. So if you go and want to see an adult movie, you will be asked for your ID. Now on your ID, there's a whole bunch of information that the cashier actually does not need to know, right? So does it, does he need to know um, your address or your full name? Um, no, you know, in fact, does the cashier need to know your exact uh, date of birth? No. What the cashier needs to know is only, are you 21? Yes or no, right? And um, a zero knowledge proof um, algorithm basically helps individuals to keep their data private, but enables other parties that need to confirm certain data um, to ask a yes, no question and get the right answer back. Okay, so that could be something that we could implement um, to, to deal with this privacy issue. Um, I want to quickly move on to transparency because that is also a, a major issue, one of those principles that we have. And um, what, is, what is transparency? Well, in our context is basically, it refers to the public view of how and if AI functionality is aligned with reality. And um, I'm trying to give you an example of what, what that actually means. So in 2018, we saw a Hong Kong-based hedge fund lose $20 million. And the investor basically went back and said, um, you know, I'm going to sue you because you sold me this um, AI hedge fund. And, um, you know, it's not supposed to lose my money, right? It's supposed to make my money. So how is this possible? Now, we don't exactly know what the outcome of this case is. But um, what we do know is there's clearly a type of an expectation gap and there's also an, an, an issue with the understanding of the investor when it comes to machine learning, right? So if you, if you want to summarize, basically the salesperson of the fund probably has promised too much and the investor has understood too little, right? And this is where um, there can be transparency issues. So what do we suggest to fix this issue? Well, on the one side, I think we believe that if people invest in AI-based products, then there need to be a lot more disclosures than we perhaps have in today in traditional um, funds, right? And um, what we also believe is that there should be a little bit more education for investors to understand the nuts and bolts of um, the machine learning uh, techniques. Yeah? Um, if you remember, I think most of the exchanges around the world have implemented similar fundamentals of derivatives, for example, classes, 
um, that investors can go to and understand, you know, what is a call, what is a put, what is a future. So what we're advocating here is some educational program that can help investors understand the basics of machine learning. Um, obviously, uh, beyond this uh, education is also important to understand biases. And then again, Keith has touched on biases already, but um, they are obviously also very important to understand some of the related risks when we talk about transparency. How much, are we, how are we doing on time? I have a few more minutes left, right? So I can hopefully finish all of my, uh, my principles. So the next one is really about explainability. Explainability, the, uh, the ability to explain a rationale behind an action and um, also very interesting in the context of financial markets, right? So imagine the situation where an investor um, has a, an ethical issue with investing in defense. And um, perhaps that um, decision is already reflected in um, the investment constraints of the funds um, that, that the fund manager manages on behalf of that, that individual. But there's a fat tail event and um, you know, perhaps there's an act of war and then the AI algorithm decides that the best possible co uh, next cause of action is to short sell a particular stock, uh, similar to what has happened in 2001 when, when we had that issue in New York. And um, you know, we don't really know, is that something that is gonna align to the investors, uh, investment constraints or is he fine with it? Um, it's a bit of a gray area, right? But what we do believe is very important for, for uh, increasing explainability is that we have regular stress testing of these algorithms, right? And um, uh, these stress tests have to happen uh, under very different market conditions as to understand the behavior of these algorithms better. Um, one thing that we should not forget is that humans' um, next cause of action is also not 100% predictable, okay? So sometimes uh, in AI, we tend to over control, but um, as you will see in my conclusion, I'm not a, not a very big fan of that. Lastly, we have accountability. And um, accountability, basically the, the ability to hold an individual or an entity accountable for their actions and um, you know, very much connected to um, explainability when we talk about AI. And um, what's the problem with accountability? Well, um, sometimes people talk about traders having to now take, uh, sorry, uh, software developers having to take trading exams or sometimes um, you know, this is quite popular in, in the field of law. People say, well, are we now suing the algorithm? Basically, our main point on this slide is the following. Um, if you are a fund manager and um, the AI of your broker does something that costs you money, you will still sue the broker, right? You will not sue the, um, uh, the software developer. You will not sue the algorithm because they're not legal entities, right? Will, will you perhaps... Um, you know, fire the person, the trader that over, has oversight over the algorithm? Yeah, you might, right? But in the end of the day, um, let's make sure to understand that the technology that we use here is basically a technology, right? And it's not its own entity. So what we do need to do, do though, is have proper policies uh, in place that can govern data quality and integrity, right? Because in the end of the day, Keith also explained earlier, right? The, the algorithms learn based on the data that is available to them, right? What we also believe is very important in terms of these types of scenarios is to make sure that we look at not only the probability of something going wrong, but also the severity, right? And you can have a, like a nice little matrix where you plot them out into four buckets and, and look at severity and probability. And then eventually your, your controls will look different for each of these different scenarios. Okay, to wrap up, and I hope I'm roughly in time, um, technology moves fast, right? On this exponential curve, um, machine learning is in finance and in financial markets is actually not an emerging technology anymore. It's too prevalent, too many people already use it. It's not free of ethical risks, and therefore these risks need to be managed carefully. 
What we have tried to do with our short chapter is to operationalize some of these principles to help financial markets professionals think about what these principles actually mean in their context. This is not conclusive, but a conversation starter that helps to operationalize. And um, I want to really uh, kind of wrap up with uh, one of my friend's quotes, Henry. He says, I see no distinction between AI and people since latter are just biological AI. Now, you can challenge Henry on this statement, but I do believe that it's very important to refrain from implementing more rigorous controls for AI than we do for humans. Why is that? Because that will really stifle innovation and um, that is something that we have to be quite careful with. And I think with that, I am done with my presentation. I'm very much looking forward to the questions of the discussants and to have a great, um, great chat after this. Let me unshare my screen. Here we go. Uh, Ujie, uh, you need to turn on your microphone. So thank you very much. Can you hear me? <laughs> so thanks for Dan's wonderful speech. Uh, opened, I think his speech is kind of open a window or a door for us to discuss more about the ethical uh, thinking about uh, how AI used in uh, in financial markets. Um, and I think we have a lot of uh, new ideas and thoughts, even questions on this area um, after hearing their speech. Now uh, let's turn to the next session that is question and answer session. I think um, uh, after the two uh, wonderful speech, the distinguished guests as well as the uh, viewers following us online will have some uh, new ideas or exchange or idea exchange uh, to these uh, to speak uh, to these two uh, keynote speaker first we will invite nafis nafis hello nafis. hi 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 huji thank you um, thanks keith thanks keith and dan for your insightful session uh, two different uh, topics and uh, very contrasting to each other. Uh, while Keith was promoting how financial services or institutions are adopting AI, and while Dan was looking at the issue underlying those adoptions. So it, it's, it's like a, a tricky situation. Uh, if we are adopting AI, then how and what will be the advantage of it? While Dan is saying that even though AI yeah, brings a lot of advantage, but have we looked at uh, the issue underlying it? For example, in terms of transparency, ethical consideration, and so on. So uh, I, I think uh, I will uh, first uh, go to Keith and just uh, to brainstorm or maybe pick up his uh, uh, idea on this. Even though the rate of adoption is increasing every quarter, every year, we see that, and the CCAF study clearly highlight that most many institutions are undergoing on that adoption. But uh, is, is it that the competitive nature of the industry which is forcing the institution to adopt AI or it is really the need of the industry which is uh, demanding the adoption of AI, Keith? Uh, I think it's a combination of the two. Um, so as I mentioned in my session, uh, fintechs are you know, one of the sources of innovation. And when incumbent financial services organizations uh, see the impact uh, fintechs are having, like Oak North, as I, I mentioned, uh, it certainly gives them a strong uh, competitive rationale for uh, continuing to try and use that kind of technology. Um, but as Dan mentioned, uh, you know, it does come with risks. And uh, when you start off on the journey, it's not always obvious uh, how you can manage those risks. I mean, everybody may be aware of bias and explainability, but actually, um, you know, when you have a real deployment, it's much more difficult to understand how to identify those risks and how to manage those risks. Uh, so I think it is a, combina a combination of uh, the competition elements that you're referring to, uh, plus that there's a compelling need, uh, be it either for revenue generation or for uh, cost reduction, uh, just in terms of being able to maintain that competitive position. Thanks, Keith. Uh, it, it, just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, again, we always talk about too big to fail in banking, you know. 
uh, that that will lead us to is too big to invest in. like many many of the asian countries especially where we are in malaysia or even if you look at thailand uh, or you look at the other indian subcontinent region the the banks are not that big compared to the to the us banking giants or even the in in the uk for example or the european region so when it comes to the size or the amount of money you have to put up in all this technology will definitely shape up the amount of investment or the growth of ai adoption so do you agree on this that the bigger banks will be in a better shape to adopt these technologies a uh, good question i mean clearly they will have resources uh, you know bench strength of uh, technical skills the ability to go out and hire experts etc um so all of those things will be to their advantage and therefore you may expect uh, you know greater leadership and leverage of ai uh based on that uh but also some large firms are not very good at innovating um so i think it's the balance between having access to the technical skills and the core technologies but balanced with the ability to innovate truly in a way which is kind of difficult if you're tied by the dna of a legacy firm so so do you do you recommend that the smaller banks or the medium sized bank should uh, collaborate with the fintech rather than innovating within their own organization I think they need to do both. I mean uh, as you as was mentioned in the introduction I'm a mentor at the Barclays Rise Accelerator and that's an interesting model I think of uh, taking a large uh, bank like Barclays and taking a fintech accelerator venture capital firm like Techstars and putting the two together to leverage the network that Techstars has on the fintech side and innovation and the regulated uh, financial services expertise and capability that Barclays have. So uh, that kind of model works very well I think to uh, bridge the gap between incumbents that can't innovate so well uh, versus fintechs that innovate very well but don't have distribution. Thanks Keith uh, I will I'll move on to Dan uh, and uh, uh, Dan you, you, your topic is very close to my heart because I always promote on the fintech regulation and this is the area where we are we are always uh, lacking and uh, looking at the responsibility and the more regulation to look after the market. now when it comes to the ai ethics or ai transparency we always uh, we have a system to blame you know i always uh, for example i give a quote a very personal example i am an expert in malaysia over 20 years having a bank account with the leading banks here and i uh, they have a ruling here that in malaysia the expat don't get a credit card for very longer period of time different banks different ruling so i recently faced a very interesting scenario at one of the largest bank the may bank for example in the country they say that uh, my renewal was refused by the ai outcome so i checked on them how come ai can refuse if i if i have a very uh, good credit rating with the bank no default or you know, a timely payment and so on so what i find out after talking to the people because uh, being an fintech person i explored the discussion with them and they came out with that uh, they look at the the the, the uh, what do you call the theme uh, or the uh, elements being put into the system to come up with the with the decision making and uh, for them expat is all expat whether they are a good expat or a bad expat or a good payer or a bad payer so when it comes to the taking the responsibility in terms of the ai making a mistake will it be completely put on the machine or human will be equally responsible uh, if uh, the outcome is bad sure so there's a lot in your question um i think you know it kind of goes back to the data and not so much the quality of the algorithm because we can assume that these algorithms that are quite old by now and has been around for a long time sort of work yeah um you know will they work without bias no um but let's let's start to think about this from another angle right so um is a bank uh obligated to tell you why they decline your credit card application right ai or no ai they're not right so if 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 you go into the bank and let's just assume you go into the bank 20 years ago and you want a loan and then you give them all the information and then they say no and then you ask why then they will have given you actually funnily enough not such a dissimilar answer they would have said well our methodology says no right and then that's a proprietary methodology and they are free to decline uh, who they give credit to um i think that's kind of interesting to to remember right another example that i was 
just thinking about is um, what happened recently, I think it's a week or two ago, with, um, with Jan LeCun. You know, Jan LeCun is, a, is, is the gentleman who basically invented deep learning. And um, there was this um, uh, deep learning algorithm that basically looked at predicting um, the, the shape or the, the face of an individual based on a very low grade photograph. And um, I don't know whether you've seen this, it's fascinating actually. So what happened was um, when we looked at the very low quality photograph, we can clearly see that is uh, President Obama's face. But the very clear quality photograph is a white gentleman. So then you can imagine what happened, right? And this time, uh, Black Lives Matter, it was a big problem. And Jan LeCun, he did quit, quit uh, Twitter on the back of this discussion, by the way. He said, well, it's all about the data, right? So uh, if I relate it to your case, you know, if Maybank basically has a lot of data that says experts have defaulted on me, whether you are then an expert that is worthy or not, you know, that's what the, that's what the algorithm predicted. I, th I think um, these, these two things are actually not too, too unrelated. I hope that answers a little bit your question. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was an example to relate uh, to the bigger picture, you know. When it comes to a decision making, especially last time where we have all human decision making and we have very clear guideline, you follow the book and you come up with that and you say yes or no. But now we, we key in the data. In fact, data is there, but who is provider of the data, who creates the theme is all human. But when it comes to the outcome, it's very easy to put the blame on the machine because machine can't be prosecuted, machine can't be taken to the court. It will be the organization. So they can put the blame on the machine, but who owes the responsibility? When things go good, human will own the responsibility. When things go bad, they can put on the machine or AI, for example, in terms of the modeling purpose. So in that aspect, who will be the blame? If the, I don't know whether I like the word blame, but the, the, the individuals that will have to take responsibility right. for um, decisions that are suggested or taken by a machine learning algorithm, if we're talking regulated financial services, will be the executive committee members that run that regulated firm, ultimately, right? Yes. It's good to get the confirmation from you. I always believe it's always the human intelligence which should oversee the machine intelligence. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I will, I, I will leave the, to the other discussion to have the question. Sure. Thank, thank you. you for question. Very good question. Thank you. Thank you for Nafis and thank you for the two uh, keynote speakers' answer. I think the question is very challenging and the answer is wonderful. And as our lectures goes on, we also see a lot of viewers are raising their questions uh, uh, on our board, so uh, uh, welcome to raise more questions on the two uh, key spe uh, keynote speakers topic. And then we will invite Eddie. Eddie, are you ready? Yeah. Hi, uh, hi, Eddie. Can you guys hear me well? Or, yeah. yeah. We yeah okay. You. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Keith and Dan. Yeah, very insightful and uh, inspiring speech. Yeah, I have two questions to both of you. The first one is more more like uh, more about you know the industry, the financial industry. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask something about, you know, the application of AI in the financial uh, markets or the in institutions, because as at least to my understanding, at least uh, to my understanding, I think that, you know, the application of AI in the financial world can be, um, I don't know, uh, uh, divided into two parts or categorized into two parts. The first one is the new products or service, right? You, you, both of you talk a lot about uh, the, you know, the how AI can help, you know, the investment uh, activities and investment analysis, maybe, you know, robot advisors, something like that. And the second would be probably, you know, uh, the, the application that can help uh, to make the, the, the financial institutions operation more efficient, for example, the chatbot, or maybe the red tech technology that can help detecting, you know, any in compliance with the law. So something like that. Although the line between the, the above two might not be very clear, but yeah, but I'm just wondering, yeah, I want to get your, you guys' view on, you know, do you think which one sounds the, the more uh, promising and valuable, and valuable from the perspective of financial institutions? Would if, if uh, the financial institutions see AI more of the opportunities to create like, uh, to, to create or develop new products or services that can generate more revenue 
or is more big, you know, operational things than you know making the financial institution to to become more efficient economically to save operational costs. Yeah, that's my first question. Uh, from my point of view, good question. I think uh, I mean the answer is uh, both. Uh, though to some extent, uh, I think the internal uh, efficiency kind of uh, implementations may be easier because they tend to have less of the external regulatory and external client sensitivity, just like the uh, credit card application situation we talked about a little earlier. Um, so they may be uh, typically low hanging fruit, for example, though still not without risk, because obviously there's the question of explainability which uh, Dan touched on, uh, that if you are using AI, for example, to um, create automation in certain complex processes, uh, you still need to have the confidence that the right decisions are going to be made when you end up with uh, relatively extreme, unlikely situations. So you need the oversight uh, and you need the understanding of how RPA, robotic process automation tools, might, might work. But the, the ultimate um, biggest source of value, I think, is still uh, in the examples you gave uh, in terms of the external client use, uh, especially of things like, as I said in my session, uh, credit default reduction, uh, provided you manage bias effectively, then effectively, you know, the firm is able to lend more because it is able to target that to uh, where the greatest, um, you know, chance of return is going to be and therefore distribute more loans as a result. Uh, it's interesting, I think, that uh, in the UK at the moment, we have a, a program to uh, sponsored by the government in terms of making loans in the wake of the coronavirus. Uh, and Oak North is one of the firms using AI to be able to make those loans, for instance, at the moment. So even though it's a fintech against the other large UK banks, uh, it's still in that position to be able to contribute to the uh, COVID recovery as well. Okay, thank you. Eddie, I, um, Eddie, I, I, have, I have to say I have very little to add to Keith's answer because I, I basically agree. It's in both spaces. Um, I wish there was more on the sort of you know, financial product side. Um, but as we know, banks are very obsessed with managing cost income ratio first and as a, as a you know, predominant kind of KPI for most people. But um, I hope to see more um, on, the, on the other side of the fence, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that can be done um, in, in the field of um, what we call um, situational finance, right? And, and how to basically serve very customized products at the right moment in time to people that, um, that might be in need of a particular program. But um, yeah, in, in, I'm, I'm in agreement with most of the things. That he's just Thank like, you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. My se second question would be about uh, the data AI investment analysis, because both of you indicated that, you know, the mo very important factor or application of AI is on the investment activities. Uh, I mean, in, in, in relation to investment analysis, for example, Dan just mentioned the quant fund, right? And also uh, indicated a paper on in, empirical asset pricing via uh, machine learning and wh you know, which uh, technology can predict the expected uh, return of, uh, of the assets. But, so it seems that both of you leads to a conclusion that uh, uh, the AI can really help uh, improve the performance of stock trading or, or, or trading of any other financial uh, products. But, but of course, I can understand that AI should be able to address some issues from the perspective of behavior economics or behavior finance because, you know, AI is not emotional, right? You will not, you know, it, AI can basically, I, I, I think AI can basically avoid, you know, the situation where uh, you did not buy when you should have bought, right? Or you did not sell when you should have sold. But uh, a, a friend of mine in, in the financial world, he, he told me that he really doubts, you know, AI can improve the performance of stock trading because, because generally speaking, we know that we need to give data to the AI to train the to train AI. We, we need to we, we we should give you know data to the AI as much as possible to train AI so AI can become stronger to 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 give more so AI can give more a uh, better prediction. But the thing is that the data are all historical information, right? Because in the financial world, of course, I'm a layman. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a financial person. But according, yeah. But Maybe according I'm, to the yeah, theory of efficient market hypothesis, right? 
because then your te te technical analysis can work only if the stock market is not efficient, right? Because technical technical analysis only focus on you know the historical data, right? The historical trend and the historical stock movement. But but some also there are there are also some people who argue that you know AI can be used for fundamental analysis as well. So so I'm wondering whether you you guys can share with us or, or educate us <laughs> whether and how. AI can really help improve the trading performance and how does AI uh, predict the stock price if we only give the historical data to the AI? Okay, so Keith, you mind if I give it a first Please, shot? Okay. please do. So, so I'm just kind of very passionate about this. So um, <laughs> a bunch of things, right? So of course, your friend who is a stock trader is going to yeah. say, no, that machine can't do the job as good as I can because he, he wants his job, right? So, so there's, <laughs> there's that. But um, if we think about you know, your broader question, actually, the, again, there's a lot in your question. So um, if we talk about you know, only looking at uh, tick data, you know, tick data is basically price data for a particular asset, right? then uh, yes, it's all about historical data. But uh, imagine how much more there is. Um, I think we've seen some of these um, photographs in Keith's um, presentation around you know, crop yields and so on and so forth. In fact, there's a very good example as well. Um, one company has developed a algorithm that can predict based on the shade of the of a tanker, oil tanker on the on the ocean, they can predict how much oil is in that tanker, right? So next time somebody uh, looks at a at an oil circulation number on Bloomberg, you know, uh, you you have to question, you know, isn't isn't that guy who can look at all of these oil tankers in real time on the ocean, you know, might he be better informed than somebody who just looks at Bloomberg, right? So I guess to to kind of summarize, number one. Um, AI and machine learning can be used in many different um, areas of the investment management discipline, right? So you started off with investment analysis, which is obviously a fundamental type of analysis, right? So can we use it there? Yes, we can use it to extract uh, insights from text, for example, right? Financial reports uh, or social media, right? Um, can we use it for trading? Yes. Um, there's very prominent examples about um, how the Marcos Lopez de Pedro team actually managed to avoid um, uh, getting hit by the flash crash. Be and, and you know, no human trader saw it. The machine pulled all of the positions and two hours later, the market crashed 15% and everyone lost a lot of money and they didn't. And they had a whole two week analysis uh, going on afterwards to understand why the machine decided the way it did, right? So, so it's interesting to see those things. But then, you know, you you think about other things like portfolio construction. Again, you know, can you can you use it there? Yes. So it's quite widely faceted, and I would caution against saying, okay, you only have a time series for one asset, and then you try to do some <laughs> regression type analysis to predict the next value. Right? It's a little bit more comprehensive than that, and you have all these different methods and all these different data sources that are at, at your disposal right now. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So, so this is your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Eddie. Uh, Thanks. So Thanks. next, we'll, yeah, and we will continue our uh, question and answer session. Next, we'll have Paul Wee. Paul Wee, are you there? Uh, hi. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank uh, you so much, Kate and Dan, for your great presentation. Uh, this really broadened my perspective on the use of AI in financial services and uh, the ethical use of AI in financial markets. Uh, for example, the use of AI for risk analytics and fraud detection, which also can reflect the way how we utilize AI, not uh, only in the private sector, but also in the pri uh, public sector. As a number of supervisory agencies in many countries started to use AI for, to support their supervision as well. I'm also personally interested in the adoption of AI in fintech business and the perception of businesses on data sharing, regulation, and regulatory uncertainty. From this point, I would elaborate a bit on the regulatory standpoint, and it also can reflect that we need a regulation, right? or we need to find the best regulatory practice for this. 
I think we need a uh, regulation to mitigate potential risk to support market players who uh, offer innovative products and services. This is also to to uh, ascertain or to promote fair competition in the market, which can uh, deliver benefit for consumers through uh, greater choices and lower prices. Uh, apart from the regulation uh, to monitor the compliance and to enforce the law effectively, even can be harder from the characteristic of technology, right? Uh, besides, uh, with regard to the ethical use of AI, we may also need uh, common practical uh, standards for AI oversight uh, and ethical uh, design framework and certification as well as industry specific uh, standards and guidelines for uh, let's say model selection, so on and so forth. Accordingly, I think it is also not an easy task for regulator to find the best regulatory practice and supervisory mechanism, especially as I experienced by myself uh, for such as a, a developing economy in Southeast Asia due to many reasons, the lack of resources, the lack of a uh, person with technology skill, as well as the lack of regulation as I mentioned before. However, I, I think it also should be noted that in the recent year, it's also interesting to see uh, that AI or machine learning can be used by regulators as well to support their supervision or subtech or supervisory technology can be seen as an example uh, to this. To give an example, the, the use of chatbot to interact with uh, regulated entities or to give them straightforward answers and also the plan to implement the machine readable regulation by the FCA UK, which also can be seen as an example. So I think this is uh, what I, I would like to supplement based on Keith and Dan presentation. And I think it should be should be great to, to discuss further on this issue. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe if I could take a first go at that. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I, I didn't cover it in my session in the interest of time. Uh, but that was one of the key questions that we asked uh, within our survey of both fintechs and uh, incumbent organizations, uh, what their perspectives were on regulation associated with uh, AI. Uh, and what was interesting, I think, I think it was 36% of the survey said that they, one of the big barriers to AI deployment uh, was regulatory uncertainty, to your point. So understanding exactly, uh, you know, questions of bias, explainability, uh, the ethical considerations that Dan referred to, uh, they, there's not necessarily uh, certainty from a regulatory perspective to know that firms are, are not stretching going beyond uh, what the regulators would be happy with. And also 36% again said that the regulatory complexity was the other issue. When the regulations did exist, they were potentially confusing uh, in terms of what they were allowed to do versus what they were not allowed to do. Um, so I think there is a, a lag uh, in terms of where AI is heading, uh, given how quickly it's moving, as we talked about. Uh, with the, the regulators that, uh, you know, we touched on the Bank of England FCA report, which, you know, is a good milestone, I think, in terms of the regulator taking a perspective on how, how AI is being used, but that's not yet reflected in the necessary uh, clarity and uh, comprehensiveness that you might wish for regulations to allow financial institutions to know exactly what they can do uh, and how they can do it, uh, which doesn't necessarily exist in the current frameworks. Mm. Yeah, just to perhaps to supplement to what Keith just mentioned, um, you know, as far as I see financial services regulation develop, people are pretty much on board with implementing certain principle based types of regulation and there's some, you know, progress on that end. Um, and then the really difficult piece starts, right? So you want to basically not be too prescriptive because that will then, you know, uh, stop us from being innovative. But then at the same time, sometimes it becomes really difficult to uh, grasp what some of these principles mean, right? And we know that some of the, the financial services regulation is applicable to small firms, right? You could be three person asset manager uh, and BlackRock, right? So, so how, do you, how do you create something that is managing the associated risks well enough and at the same time you know how do you avoid from what, what we can perhaps call regulatory creep which is 
you know, thousands of pages on what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, right? This is, this is um, I think your, your question is a very good one because it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, to get right. Um, and I think, um, and somebody asked this on, on Q&A earlier, actually, I think the solution to it is not to create these humongous amounts of, of rules that then everyone has to follow, but to put a lot of focus on education, right? Because if we all as, as market participants understand the risks and the opportunities that come with the use of machine learning better, then I think it will, it will remove a lot of the risk and the uncertainty that we perhaps uh, perceive today. Is it okay? Okay, so, so did he answer your question? Yes, yes, uh, thank you very much for, for okay. uh, Keith and then quick uh, answer, yep. Oh, good question. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all of you. And then now uh, we have uh, lasting our uh, lecture for at uh, for nearly one and a half hour. And still, we will see that a lot of questions uh, are raised uh, by the viewers. And then because uh, I think the uh, topic arises a lot of people's uh, interests and the thoughts in this area. And then we will uh, turn to uh, Dr. Chen Hongyi. Uh, if you have any questions, you can raise your question. If uh, not yet, uh, you can uh, uh, forecast the next uh, lecture's uh, things, okay? Yeah. I think I'm sure we need to have another webinar. Uh, I think okay. given that we have very uh, interesting discussion today. So before we close the session uh, today, uh, let me uh, maybe add one quick question to get all of your perspective. So uh, given that both Keith and also uh, Daniel let you mention about uh, how should we uh, govern and also regulate the AI, uh, given that AI now is become promising and uh, uh, gradually uh, become sophisticated. So my question is, how shall we regulate uh, artificial intelligence? And uh, specifically uh, think about regulatory sandbox. Uh, when it first introduced in the UK just a couple of years ago, uh, just after a few years, it's adopted by so many jurisdictions, over 50 countries adopt the regulatory sandbox. But how many jurisdictions really successful operate uh, that mechanism? I think just a few. And I think this posed to another question is, uh, when we come up with a regulation, who is be the best uh, maybe uh, identity to uh, operate and manage it? So will that be a uh, government, will that be the regulator, or will that be the self-regulatory uh, body? For example, like Japanese cryptocurrency industry uh, is, is highly uh, co-governanced by the Japanese uh, financial service agency and also the Cryptocurrency Industry Association. So in your opinion, how shall we uh, regulate artificial intelligence? By regulator or by self-regulation or co-governance? So uh, Kiss, I want to get your perspective first. <laughs> uh, I have two parts, I think, to my answer. The first is uh, knowing how to regulate, understanding what the uh, levers and capabilities are. I think that requires quite a lot of collaboration between all the parties you talk about. So for example, the uh, tech firms, uh, those that have the experience of using uh, AI and obviously the regulators and the self-regulatory uh, bodies as well. Uh, I think it requires quite a lot of collaboration to take the input from the, the way the technology is heading, uh, the way the technology is used in practice already, and obviously the regulatory principles that exist. Uh, but ultimately, you know, regulations should sit with the regulator, as I said before, clarity is important. Uh, and therefore, ultimately, it's to the regulator in that particular jurisdiction to lay down the rules, obviously, uh, that everybody has to abide by. Uh, but I think in order for them to be effective and fit for purpose and also to be forward looking in terms of how the technology will evolve and not to allow the gap between the technology and how the technology is being regulated to widen too much, it does require that collaboration right at the beginning to be able to uh, make the whole process effective. Okay, so we got the first keyword collaboration. And Daniel? I, I have a, a bit of a contrarian view on this. 
So when we talk about um, you know, regulatory sandboxes, I think my understanding is they are very much there to enable um, fintech companies that don't, know, that don't quite know which uh, license they need to experiment in a safe, safer environment with a limited number of, of clients, right? And um, therefore, I would say we don't really regulate the technology, right? We regulate regulated activities, right? So if, if we then use um, something like machine learning in, let's say, asset management or I don't know, um, you know, dealing in securities or any other of these regulated um, activities, then we obviously have to make sure that we observe the, the, the law and then the regulation that is derived from those laws, right? So, so therefore, um, I don't think that there should be, you know, no financial services regulator should basically enact a law that deals with uh, how to use machine learning and finance. I think that would be the wrong thing, right? We have very established frameworks. Uh, we know what the regulated activities are. And most of the regulators today are very open to um, consult with the industry when something new happens, right? Uh, one example that I like to think of has nothing to do with AI, but eventually something called the utility token showed up. And then nobody knew where to put that, right? And then is it a security, not a security? So then eventually um, what happened is most jurisdictions didn't really change the law, but what they did is they said, okay, um, this thing falls under the, under the purview of securities law or not, right? So I think I would, I would welcome a similar approach where we, we kind of keep abreast of new developments, but at the same time, make sure that those um, activities that are regulated today um, are the ones that, that the regulator should look at. Okay, so abreast uh, those new technology. So Eddie, I want, uh, we were also very much to get your perspective, given that I think you also work with a regulator quite closely. Um, you, you mean, you mean the how, how to regulate AI? Right. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, I think because you know, at current state, because you know, there although there are a lot of you know application you know of AI or a lot of you know imagination about you know the the proposed AI application, but I would say that it might be too early to regulate AI, especially to have specific law or regulation governing AI. Although you know, you know, I I forgot it. It was uh, Keith or Dane who talked about a lot about you know the principle and ethical rules about ai right i mean uh, i mean uh, especially uh, i think europe uh, japan and some oecd maybe and, and even in, in taiwan we have some you know ethical rules for ai development ai r and d rules but i think yeah those are good principles and uh, i think they can really you know uh, address the issue that where you know one day you know <laughs> the ai will become a real human in and harm us but I think so far, at, at least now, I don't think it's a, it's a good time to create any you know, AI specific law, specific law regulations. But in Taiwan, we, 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 we do have some discussion about whether to, to, to set out some like so-called like AI basic law. But I think the, the, those, those regulations are more like, or more about, you know, you have to support the industry instead of having some, you know, like punishment or some like, I don't know, like the enforcement actions again, uh, again in the AI developer or the, or the manufacturer of merchants. So, I think, uh, for for example, there was some discussion about uh, uh, that's not in the financial area, but some IP area because in the IP area, many people discuss whether you know the AI can have the ownership to to say patent or to copyright. Yeah. So, if you really want to give or to grant, you know, the AI a copyright or patent right, right? Then, then you need to amend the law. At least for, uh, at least I, I believe you need to do so for those civil law countries. But I think it's still too early. I think people will still need to discuss. That's okay. my view. Yeah. Observe it first. And the Paui. Oh, I think it's a very interesting question. And actually, I think I can briefly answer your question that uh, I think it's really uh, rely heavily on the local differences and also local context. Because as you raise the issue that maybe 
uh, from Japanese experiences, they can regulate crypto uh, currency or uh, digital asset industry quite well by using self regulation. But I think if I look back to Thailand or other country in Southeast Asia, especially for developing economy, I think we still lack of the uh, industry standard organizations. And maybe it's also really difficult for us to adopt the same uh, solution because I think there is no one size fits all solution for this. And uh, apart from the self regulation mechanism for the use of innovative regulatory tools as well, it's also really challenging for regulators in developing economies to to prepare for the resources and also to uh, to decide for the framework for this uh, new initiative. And also, I I also agree with with uh, with others uh, uh, mentioned that uh, maybe we we still not no need for uh, specifically decide uh, regulation or specific regulation for AI. But I think for in terms of the regulatory framework, I, in in my view, I think. We still need other surrounded uh, regulation, for example, maybe related to the data protection law and also the trade secret law. So this is my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for all of your valuable insight on that. So also many thanks, Keith and Dan, uh, AD and Paui, and also uh, Nafis, and also uh, of course that Hu Jie that your wonderful uh, hosting. So uh, before we close the session today, I want to make a quick announcement for our upcoming webinar. So we have the pleasure to invite both legal and the industry experts to review fintech development and the regulation in uh, Malaysia this evening at 8 p.m. Uh, Beijing time. I hope that topic might pique your interest. So once again, thank you, Kiss, Daniel, Nafis, Adi, and Paui, Hu Jie, and hope to see you all in person, maybe in London, in Singapore, in Kuala Lumpur, in Taipei, in Bangkok. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye.